for the amen. We made it through another week, survived another week, hallelujah. Thank you for being here this morning. God is worthy of our praise. I'm thankful that his blood was shed, aren't you? I'm thankful that he comes or we can come to him and he has open arms waiting on us. Man, what a savior we have, amen. And you can be seated if you'd like or maybe you want to stand. I don't know, wherever you get it from, right? I love to praise the Lord. I'm hoping that you came this morning with a mindset that I'm going to praise the Lord no matter what. I'm going to believe no matter what. It don't matter what's come against me this week. I'm in the house of God now, and I can settle, and I can rest, and I can just take a breath. Everybody do that, <gasps> right? Take a breath and just enjoy being in here for just the next few minutes. And uh, that's, uh, that's a, f a faith statement right there, right? Next few minutes. Uh, if we're not careful, we'll be here a long time, but I'm believing today that no matter what your past 11 months, aren't you glad it's December? Are you glad? Have you dreaded December because you're getting ready to spend a bunch of money at Christmas? Let me help you with that. Let me give you just a quick advice. Don't spend it. Don't spend it. I believe that when we make up our mind that we're going to do what God asks us to do, we're going to stand the way God asks us to stand. I, I don't think we should have those worries. And the worries that we have, nine times out of ten, we bring on ourselves. And so I'm going to challenge you this December that no matter what your past 11 months looks like, that this month is going to be your best month of 2018, that you're going to allow God to minister to your life, speak to your, your stuff that's going on in your mind. Because, listen, I believe that 2018 should be a great year. Right? And so we've got 11 months behind us. And so I'm wondering, has it been a great year? Has it been a year that you're glad it's over? Has it been 11 months that have just uh, took you off guard? Has it been one of those times uh, that you just can't seem to get it together? And if that's you today, then make up your mind for the next 28 days, this is going to be my best month yet. Amen? Somebody cast something out of that. Hallelujah. Can y'all hear it or is it just me? Uh, every now and then, every now and then, my ears will be ringing, and I ask Pastor Tammy, are your ears ringing, or is it just mine, right? And, and so I'm just glad somebody's hearing it besides me, because that would have scared me a little bit if nobody else was. And so we just trust the Lord today. I, I know what these 11 months have looked like. I get it. I, I understand that for some of you and for some of us, that we've walked through some of the toughest times of our lives in the last 11 months. We've experienced things we hoped and we wished and we prayed that we had never experienced, but they were there. And we found ourselves in different uh, circles of life or maybe a different season of life even where you had to make up your mind if I'm going to keep going or if I'm going to throw in the towel. And so if you're here today, you apparently decided to keep going. It's the empty seats that I'm concerned about. It's the ones that maybe gave up. It's the ones that maybe quit. It's the ones that couldn't go on and didn't make up their mind. And so with these 11 months behind us, it don't matter who you are, you either had a lot of those thank you God moments or you had a lot of help me God moments, or maybe you had a little bit of both. Maybe you had the good, the bad, and the ugly, but you saw the hand of God through it all. And so I want to talk to you about that just a little bit. I don't want this 11 months. If you've had a terrible 11 months, don't let that define your December. I, I believe that this should be, in, in my personal opinion, uh, this should be one of the greatest months of your year. As you think about and you anticipate, listen, this is a time when we were anticipating there's a king coming, there's a savior that's going to be born. And man, just in a few short weeks, a few short days, and it'll fly by if you haven't got your Christmas shopping done. It'll fly by uh, if you don't have the money to buy Christmas. But I'm telling you that by the end of this month, we are going to see that a savior has been born. We are going to see that God sent us hope so that you and I don't remain hopeless, so that you and I don't remain defeated, so that you and I don't don't crumble and fall, amen? And so I'm excited today to share some more of the gospel. If we ever forget, listen, God has just been speaking uh, to us lately, especially here recently, uh, about discipleship. And discipleship comes right from this pulpit, but discipleship comes from mom and dad. Discipleship comes from that uh, foyer out there, from those classrooms in there. And, and so there's times in our lives that we either want to be discipled or we don't. There, there's a season in your life that you make up your mind that from this day forward, I'm serving God. I'm in it to win it. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. And so if we ever forget why we're here to see souls saved, to see those that are saved lifted up for the glory of God and that we keep moving forward, you should walk in this building every week and feel like, hey, I'm going to a family reunion. I I'm going to a place that I know they love me. I know that there's a God that loves me. I know they're going to pray for me and lift me up. I, I know they're going to encourage me. And so when you come to the house of God, there should be an expectancy in you. And so when we sum up our 11 months, either the good, the bad, or the ugly, I want to sum it up and tell you this, God was always there. 
God never did leave. He was listening to every cry you had, every need you had. He saw every tear that you've shed over these last 11 months. And I want to speak to you over this next month that we concentrate and we kind of get our mindset on Jesus. And I can tell you the best way to do that is pray. The best way to do that is have a relationship with him that I believe that when you pray to him, it changes you. I believe that when you pray and you have a prayer life, it changes your perspective. It brought, draws you closer to Christ and it builds your faith. And so I'm going to challenge you over the next 28 or 29 days. Let me tell you something. Once you start doing this, it, it, it won't just be a habit. It'll be a lifestyle. You see, I don't like habits. I, I, I'm not a habit person. Somebody says, man, my prayer life's just become a habit. Don't let it become a habit. Because you'll drop a habit like a hot rock. You will quit a habit. But when you allow it to be and let it be a lifestyle, that's something you can't get out of that easy. And so I'm believing today as you hear this word, it's going to change your life. I want to encourage you. Pray. Listen, your prayer life matters. Your prayer matters. There's some of you here because somebody prayed for you. There's some of you still here because somebody interceded for you. And so I don't want you to forget that, how important you are, how important you are to the kingdom of heaven. If he didn't love you, you wouldn't still be here. If he didn't have a purpose for you. Pastor Tammy said, and I don't know if it was in service or during our conversation or whatever, but she said, I know that when God takes me home, then he's finished with me here. I know that he's finished. I know that I've accomplished everything that he allowed me to accomplish, and he's taken me on to heaven. And so when we have that mindset, it won't make it easy for everybody else, right? But it can make it easy on us. And so I want to share with you out out of 1 Thessalonians Chapter 5, 16 through 18. I, I believe that if we'll start our day with this scripture, start our week, start our month, and, and even end this year. I want this year for you to look back at the end of December, no matter what the first 11 months look like, but you to say, this was my greatest year yet. This was my greatest year in Jesus yet, that I got to see the hand of God. I got closer to him than I've ever been. I I, I had a revelation that he's not looking for perfection, but he's looking for progression. And I'm closer to him right this minute than I was a year ago. And and so I want to challenge you with the scripture today. It says, rejoice always. Now that's a tough one, isn't it? That's a tough one. Uh, I told you on Wednesday night I'd try to have a video for you from the Virginia Tech ball game last weekend. I don't have it, but I'll have it next week. And, and one reason I don't have it is some of the people aren't here that's in that video. Because I saw them cheering and, and yelling and spinning. One, one of them spinning circles, and I've never seen them spin circles here. And, and so I'm looking. Listen, I'm looking for a circle spinning praise after I show that video next week. Uh, out of somebody, right? Out of somebody in particular. And I'll let you decide who that is. But it says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so if you're that person, listen, I know there's people that spend their whole lives making this statement. I'm just trying to find the will of God. I just was hoping to find the will of God. I just wish I could get, have a revelation of the will. This is the will of God right here. This will bring you out of your ho-hum. This will bring you out of your uh, a state of despair. This will bring you out of your place of hunting and searching. This will start you off on the right track. It says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so he made it personal. He didn't say for y'all. He didn't say for the church. He said, for you, this is the will of God that you rejoice always. For you, this is the will of God, that you pray without ceasing. For you, this is the will of God, that in everything you give thanks. It will change, listen, it will change your life. I hear people say, I don't really have that much to be thankful for. Well, and and I can't tell you any more of that. And, And so, I think there's a way you can be thankful. Don't, it's not my way. It's God's way. He says, this is the will of God. And until you find yourself in the will of God, you'll not be happy. You'll not be satisfied. You'll not find yourself any contentment. But when you find yourself in the will of God, and right here's where it starts, you ask Jesus into your heart, that's the will of God. That's why he gave his son Jesus, so that you and I, and all of our ugly and all of our nasty, that we could come to Christ, him with open arms, and say, Father, forgive me. Please forgive me. I accept what you did for me at Calvary. And, and you move on from there. You don't run back in your mess. You don't back back in the ditch. You don't jump back in the pit. But instead, you move forward for the glory of God. This is the will of God. It was the will of God that you be saved, that you not perish. That's why he sent his only son. But the will of God with our relationship with him starts right here. I believe it's important that you start right here. Rejoice always. 
But pastor, you don't know what I've been through, but he's still God. But you don't know, he's still king of glory. They can't unseat him. Your problem didn't surprise him. He wasn't caught off guard. Rejoice in the fact that he knew what was going to happen and he's growing you through it. Pray without ceasing. Now, you can't pray without ceasing and walk around murmuring and mumbling to yourself or out loud or get up on your soapbox. You're going to look like a freak. You're going to look like a nut. Nobody's going to want that. They're going to say, get that dude away from me. Get her away from me. They have lost their ever-loving mind. But to pray without ceasing, that's not what that means. It means to, to have a constant reoccurring. If you wake up in the middle of the night, your first thought shouldn't be, why can't I sleep? There should be a prayer thought on your mind. God, I thank you that that you've given me life. God, I thank you that my children are saved. I'm thanking you, God, and believing that tomorrow is going to be a great day. I promise you, once you start praying, you'll go back to sleep. Either pray or read your Bible. That's it. Pastor, I ain't been able to sleep for weeks. When was the last time you read your Bible? Uh, Okay, don't matter. How about about 10.30, you get your Bible out and start reading? You'll be asleep in five minutes. I mean, that's just the way it is. I'm the sleepiest when I'm reading my Bible. I am the wore outest when I'm trying to pray, when I'm trying to concentrate. Do you pray standing? I pray standing. Why? Because I'm less likely to fall asleep standing up. (laughs) I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Set a brick on your foot. It's hard to sleep with a brick on your foot, right? Let's, yeah, yeah. Whatever it takes, but it says pray without ceasing. This doesn't mean un, uh, nonstop praying. Uh, this from a Hebrew word means to constantly reoccur. It's kind of, let's just say some of you had a nagging cough. And it's kind of funny that I'm saying that because first service, I use this same illustration. And about mid of first service, I got a text message. I don't know what they thought I'd be doing right now. And so I got a text message. Pastor, I'm going to leave early. I can't quit coughing. And I'm thinking, you should have came in the sanctuary and gave us an example of what that looks like because I'm getting ready to tell you about something. And so you have that nagging cough. Anyone ever had that? I have this cough. Pastor, I can't get rid of it. I've got this nagging. I have this croupy cough that I just can't get rid of. It don't matter. I can try my best. Not to, Pastor, that's why I've not been to church. <laughs> that's why I've not been to church. I've got a nagging cough. Well, let me say this. That nagging cough, what is that? Why do you call it a nagging cough? Because you can't help it. Why why do you call it a nagging cough? You can't do anything to stop it. That's what it means when it says pray without ceasing. I have the can't help it's when I'm praying. I have the can't help it's when I'm rejoicing. I have the can't help it's when I'm thankful. When you set your heart to do it, when you make up your, it's it's not like you pray without ceasing, but you can't help but pray. I wake up in the middle of the night. I'll just be honest. I wake up in the middle of the night, and I'm thinking, man, I need to go to sleep. That's my first thought. Is it yours? Man, I wish I could sleep. Now, some of y'all know what your first thought is. Let me grab my phone so I can put on Facebook. Here it is, 246, and I'm awake. I know what you're doing because I read it the next morning. But it's our opportunity in that moment that when, you'll know where your mind is when you wake up in that moment. You'll know where your mind is when you settle in the evening, when you settle during the day, when you have a quiet time. What happens? What comes out of your thoughts? What comes out of your mouth? What comes out of your mind? He said, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, which means constantly recurring. I'm praying for that. God, I'm believing for my children to be saved. I'm believing for my spouse to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, I trust you in my family. God, I thank you for the food that's in the cabinet. God, I thank you for the money that paid for this meal I'm about to have. I don't know how you guys look at it, but I'm just trying to give you something that's going to change your life, that you have a prayer life. Because the enemy would love nothing more but to convince you that you have a 10-minute God. He would love for you to think you've got a 20-minute God. Uh, You've got a two-hour God. Well, where does that come from? Because you have a 10-minute prayer life. And so if you have a 10-minute prayer life, the enemy can roll in and easily convince you that, that you just have a 10-minute God. You have a two-hour God. You have a, hey, hey, hang on, I don't have a prayer life. Well, then, what, there you go. And so when we have a communication with him, it builds our relationship with Christ. It builds our faith. And in everything, give thanks. In all circumstances, give thanks. We have someone in our church right now. And, uh, of course, I'm not going to tell all their business. But I'll share with you that Brad Reedy needs prayer. I'll share with you that his wife Lisa needs prayer. They're going through some stuff. We sit in the hospital with them all day last week, and uh, they're going through some things. They go to the oncologist this Thursday to get a definite diagnosis, and we're just going to say, you know what? They're going to they're going to believe. They're going to say, you know what? We can't even find anything here. We don't see what we saw two weeks ago is gone. We're going to believe as a family of believers, as a family of of, of believers in Christ, a family, his family, their family. 
We're going to trust God for the outcome of this, but we're going to rejoice in the process. We're going to pray without ceasing, and we're going to give thanks for this opportunity because it is an opportunity for somebody to make up their mind, listen, I don't care how bad it gets, God's still God. I don't care how tough it looks, God's still God. He's never been unseated. He's not going to be unseated. And Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father praying for me, interceding for me, believing for me. And so when we see, listen, I I love to praise as much as anybody. I love to rejoice as much as anybody. And, and so you're going to say, Pastor, I love to praise as much as you do. I love that. And so let's do that. Let's rejoice in the Lord. Let's rejoice always. Let's pray without ceasing. Don't give up on your family. Don't give up on your friends. It may have been six months. It may have been two years. You may have been praying for your spouse for ten years. Keep praying. Pray without ceasing. God is going to answer your prayer. It's going to change your relationship, change your perspective. There's going to be something different happening in you. Somebody's going to know that there's something different. They're going to say, have you been praying? You know what I love more than anything? Somebody come to me and say, could you quit praying for me? Could you just quit praying for me? I have been miserable for two weeks. Uh, Would you quit praying for me? I can't even stand to smell alcohol anymore. Can you just quit praying for me? I mean, that's awesome. That's awesome. Some of you have had those testimonies lately, how people's come to you and said, please quit praying for me. I can't even look at this anymore. I can't even think about this anymore. And and I know right that moment, you just begin to give them the business again, didn't you? And so we appreciate those testimonies. Pray without ceasing. Uh, The the illustration about the cough. Listen, no one wants a nagging cough. Don't misunderstand me. Uh, But there's something that should be happening in you that you want to praise God, that you want to thank God, that you want to pray that God would would move on your behalf or your family's behalf. I I love this right here. It says in James chapter 5 and 16, it says, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You see, I, I don't know that we do that. Confess my faults that I may be healed. Confess my sin that I may be healed. You see, I, I don't know that we play with that very much because everybody has a secret closet, don't we? Everybody has a, 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 maybe a secret sin, a secret something that you don't want everybody to know about. Uh, maybe you've received a text message lately about it. Nobody knew it, but all of a sudden you got a text message that answered something in your spirit. Should I quit this? Should I stop doing this? Should I break this off? Should I keep moving forward? Should I lock down and keep going? Should I set my mind on it? And, and then God begins to reveal to you. But look, I love this last part. It says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You see, I believe that when we see that, uh, the, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man produces much. Produces much. You see, why do we pray? Because I'm looking for some produce. I'm looking for some fruit. I'm looking for some healing. I'm looking for some deliverance. I'm looking for this church to be full. I'm looking for your family to be blessed. I'm looking for your finances to turn around. I'm looking for peace in your house. I'm looking for calm over your family and over your marriage. I'm looking for God to do a great work. Why? Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, if I gave you the tautology note on that, if I gave you what I think that means, it means uh, the red hot, full of faith, sincere, confident prayer of a man of God or prayer of a woman of God accomplishes much and produces much fruit. And so that's my thinking on it, that when I lock in, you see that a fervent means red hot, red hot. I know some of you use that when you see your bride this evening. I know you're going to steal that from me, right? Right. While she's cooking dinner. While she's whatever, right? And you're going to say something about that. But the fact is this. It means red hot. A red hot prayer. A red, where does a red hot prayer come from? With confidence that you know who God is. You know who Jesus is. That you know what he'll do for you. He promises or two or three are gathered together. Where two or three will touch any one thing. Where we'll agree upon touching any one thing. He'll be there and he'll make it happen. There should be something red hot expectation in me every time I go to the throne of grace and ask God to move. There should be something in me, something in us. Every time we go before the throne of grace, there should be something red hot that when you get finished praying, you just turn to your spouse and say, honey, get ready. It's about to get silly up in here. I got a red hot feeling inside. I know God's going to move. I know God's going to do something because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or a righteous woman availeth much, produces much. There should be, not, I don't like these little seven word prayers and we move on like nothing ever happened. I want to pray. I want you to pray. I want us to pray and just be looking. I'm waiting on that foot to grow back. I'm waiting on God to heal them. I'm waiting on God to do I'm watching and waiting with bated breath, waiting on God to turn that marriage around. The effectual fervent prayer. I believe there has to be some confidence when you pray to the King of glory, that you have to by faith. Where does confidence come from? Where does faith come from? Same place. 
that I know, that I know, that I know he's the king of kings, that I know, that I know that I'm a child of God, that I know, that I know that these last 11 months didn't break me and I'm not going to be broken in December. I can tell you I didn't quit these last, I'm not going to quit in December. This is going to be the best month of my life. No matter what, pray, pray, don't give up on them, don't give in. Because listen, that red hot, I love a red hot, I just like to hear somebody pray red hot, don't you? Somebody say, boy, they could pray. You know what that means? They probably heard a red hot fervent prayer. They probably heard an effectual fervent prayer. If they heard that kind of effectual fervent prayer, God heard that effectual fervent prayer, guess what? You just hang out with them because something's getting ready to break loose. Something's getting ready to happen. I like to hang out with people that think something's getting ready to happen. And let me tell you a quick story. Dr. Robert Jeffress, he's the pastor of First Baptist of Dallas. I don't know if you keep up with him. He's a great author, just a great speaker. He's, he's one of our favorite guys, uh, pastors uh, that, we, that we watch and we keep up with. And, and so I want to tell you, he was sharing a story recently about his daughter, and she had experienced three miscarriages, three miscarriages. And so she came to him and said, Dad, listen, we've been praying, and we're praying uh, that God's going to bless us. We're going to try again. We're going to go again, and we're believing, and we're trusting God, and, and we're praying for triplets because we want a life for every life that was taken and so as a dad he said he wanted to say honey listen you're listen come here but let's just let's just believe let's just pray and believe that God's gonna you know gonna do something but but you're setting yourself up for failure that was what came in his mind you but but, but you've already had three miscarriages what if God don't you're, you're getting he said that's what I wanted to say to her but she was so confident she said dad we're praying for triplets because God's going to give us a life back for every life that was lost so guess what he know? He's got on board. You just get on board. Does it look, what's it look like in the natural? Who cares? The Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. What's it look like in the natural? It don't matter. I've been thinking about Brad and Lisa this week. I know what it looks like on paper. I know what it looks like and what it felt like sitting there for, for hours upon hours while they had done their stuff and run their tests and done their surgery. I get that. But it don't matter. The Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. See, by sight, who can fix it? By sight, we're going to trust the doctors. By faith, we're going to trust God. And so we're going to trust God. We're going to believe God to intervene and make it. Make, but listen, Dr. Jeffers, guess what? Guess how many grandkids he had in that birth? Three. Why? Because the effectual fervent prayer produces much, availeth much, that we don't give up, that we don't give in. Three miscarriages, most people would have quit. I mean, let's be real, right? We would have quit. We would have gave up. Said, listen, we're not putting your body through that again, honey. But they didn't. They made up their mind. We're going to lock in. We're in this thing to win it. They, listen, that, does that not do something in you? That my land's in the natural. This is not going to happen. It's not meant for God. It's, God's plan is not for you to have kids. Bam, three. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that's awesome. That's the way God works. That's what I'm talking about, that when you allow God, listen, when you allow, to, allow yourself to have a prayer life, it'll change you. It may change you by three. Some of you are saying, oh, help, help us, help, help us, Lord, help us, Jesus. <laughs> Anytime anybody calls Pastor Tammy and I says, hey, listen, we want to let you know we're pregnant. We say, praise God, I'm glad it's you and not us. Hallelujah. <laughs> praise the Lord. We start rejoicing for them for a little while. And that it's not us for a little while longer. <laughs> God is faithful. He is awesome. But look, I promise you, if you'll allow God to change your perspective, your life will never be the same. Change your relationship, your life will never be the same. Your prayer life will build your faith. I'm going to do two more prayers and we're going to close. But I love to think about it because when I think about God, sometimes I think about that God that answers prayers like that. You, you know him? Y'all know him, don't you? You've seen him. But then that God that you pray and 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 you finally say, you know what? I don't know if he's going to answer or not. I don't even know if he hears me or not. Had somebody tell me recently, they said, Pastor, I've just been laying here in this bed and it, it, it don't feel like my, prayer, my prayers are coming, bouncing off the ceiling. It feels like they're not even making it outside the roof of this house. It just feels like, and I'm, I'm sitting there listening to them thinking. And, and, and so, you know, you let them finish. I get that. But really, how far do your prayers have to go? The Bible says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. How far does your prayer have to go, really? You see, I'm pretty confident that God is in here with us. And I'm pretty confident that if you have the mindset of the enemy has told you uh, that your prayers won't even make it to the ceiling, I still think you're okay. 
Because God's here. It, it, it don't have to go through that ceiling. That, that farce that the enemy has told people to make them quit praying and quit believing and quit trusting God is just that. It's a lie from the pits of hell. You see, mine don't have to go through the ceiling. I got, God's right here. I could hand him a note. You know, it didn't have to go through the ceiling, right? It didn't have to go through the ceiling. And so when I look at that, I think about that God that, Lord, you got my note. You got my note. But look, I'm inspired by, by John chapter 10, verse 27, and this is just a side note. But it says, my sheep will hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You see, I believe it's a two-way street. I believe that you communicate with him. And all, all of us that say, you know, I'm just waiting on God to tell me something. Well, when's the last time you listened? When was the last time you prayed and listened? When was the last time you took a minute? God just revealed to me this and that, and we take off on our day. Everybody needs a prayer time. I'm telling you. You mamas with 10 or 12 kids, 15 kids, 19 kids and counting, whatever, you, you need some prayer time. When the husband gets home, say, hey, baby, I, I've been with him all day. I need prayer time. I, I need, Calgon can do whatever it can do, but God's got to do the rest. And so you trust Calgon and you trust God. And so you move forward in that. But let me give you two, two quick prayers that we can see both happen. You, you know, we can see Elijah in his prayer. And there were times when God answered prayers quickly. And we saw that with Elijah when he was praying fire down from heaven to defeat the priests of Baal. Y'all remember that? It took place on Mount Carmel. I'm telling you, if you go get in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. And I'm telling you, it'll build a fire inside of you. I'm, I'm telling you that we serve a God that is awesome and is mighty. And when you get that prayer, when you see what took place right there, this was a three-and-a-half-day process for him to rebuild the altar after the prophets of Baal uh, tore the altar down and, and messed everything up. And so he built this altar back, and they put the wood on it, and they put the rock on it, put the wood on it, put the sacrifice on it, and then he had them dump water after water after water. They dug a trench around it. There's water standing in the trench. There's no way this thing's going to catch on fire. No way. In the natural, no way. By sight, no way. But I love this prayer, and some people will tell you it's a 69-word prayer. I'm telling you, you don't have to pray a 69-word prayer, but I can tell you what a 69-word prayer done in this book. Now, my new King James left out a few these and thous, and so it's a 64-word prayer in case you're counting. And so when we look at this, it said, And it came to pass at the time of the offering and of an uh, evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, so Elijah the prophet has come near to this uh, altar that he's built, the wood that he's put on it, the sacrifice that's put on top, and all the barrels of water that's been poured over it. He came, this is a heated moment. Let me tell you, this is a heated moment. He is the only one ready to stand for God right here. He is the only one that's taken a stand in this, congrega in this circle, congregation of people. And it may be that in your workplace, you're the only one. It may be in your house, you're the only one, but God's still God. In the work, God's still God. It may, you may feel that God's still God. And so when you begin to pray to him, you pray believing. You pray with an expectancy. Do you think for a second, knowing that they were going to kill him, cut his head off, do you, do you think for a second he would have stepped to that altar if he had any doubt? Not for a second. But he went with fervency. He went with, with an affection. And affection is what? That's something inside of me. I have affection for Pastor Tammy. Not that we're going to discuss. But I have affection for this church. I have affection for the ministry. I have affection for God. And when I pray, there's an affection in that. That I know God's getting ready to do something. And so Elijah began to pray. He stepped up to the altar. He said, now listen to these. This is just simple. There's not even any words in this I can't pronounce. It's awesome. And so when you look at it, he says, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts, that you have turned their hearts back to you again. That's it. That was it. Well, that didn't seem like a very big prayer. Well, maybe we needed to be standing there. Maybe you need to be standing there, surrounded by the enemy. I got a fire, I got a, a, a sacrifice in front of you, altar in front of you, and the only thing standing between you and success is God. That's it. Better than that, your faith in God. Wait, your prayer to God. Your effectual, fervent prayer to God. And so he began to pray that. And I believe as he began to pray it, they didn't have microphones. He's letting them know, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Israel, let them know today that you are God. Isn't that a prayer? And so what took place? Most of you know that, let me just read it. 
And so it ended up being a 64-word prayer in this book, a prayer by word and a prayer by faith. And verse number 38, verse 38 is the one man against me tore up. Verse 38 is the one that I, I'm reminded that God is no respecter of persons. That what, we think that they're just super superheroes, right? The, the Superman and the Spider-Man and the Batman of the Word. But they're just like you and me. They're just like you and I. Elijah's the same as you and me, and I'm going to give you that scripture in a minute. But verse 38 says, then the fire fell from heaven. What? On a 64-word prayer, they really didn't have any big words in it. No crying and snotting. They didn't have a church service. They didn't sing three hymns or three praise songs. No, nobody took up an offer, and he just prayed and believed. Verse 38. It says, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. It consumed the wood. It consumed the stones. Listen, I'm good with the sacrifice. I get it. I built a fire and it has consumed the wood. But I've never seen a fire that would consume the stone, consume the dust, and even lap up. Look, can you imagine what that looked like? And it's burning it up, eating it up. And look, look, look. Can you see the flames? It says it licked up, lapped up all the water out of the trench. Can you imagine those flames just reaching out? <laughs> I'm telling you, y'all should have been there. I don't know about you, but I've got that, uh, I don't know what you call it. Some people call it juvenile. But I've got an imagination that I, I can be there. Because the Word of God is true. This is better than the beanstalk. How <laughs> lands. You've been there. You climbed the beanstalk. You saw the giant. Surely, if we can follow Mother Goose all through our childhood, if we can get locked into Mother Goose in the nursery rhyme, surely, how much more powerful is the word and the faith in God that a God that would send fire down from heaven and it would consume the sacrifice, it would consume the wood, it would consume the rocks, consume the dust, and then lap out all the water out of the trench. For the glory of God. You see, that's my God. And if he's not your God, he needs to be. If you don't see him like that, you need to see him like that. That with that one prayer, he answered and boom. But look, hang on, because I know you're thinking, I prayed once and nothing happened. So let's look at Elijah again, because I don't want to pull anybody else in here and you think, well, he was different from that and this and that. This is the same guy. So we move forward a little bit, and we move forward in the Word, and it says right here, let's look. The prophet is praying. He's already prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years, and guess what happened? It didn't rain for three and a half years. But now that he's praying for rain, he's prayed six times. And every time he's prayed, he sent his servant out. He said, go out and look at the sky and tell me if you see any rain. And so he'd gone out six times. He'd been out six times. And six times, let me tell you, Elijah didn't give up. Elijah didn't quit praying. Elijah didn't quit believing. Elijah didn't quit sending. What if he had quit on number two? What if he gave up on number three? What if he's like us and maybe number six he gave up? We wouldn't even have this story in the Word of God. We teach this story and we talk about the power and the faithfulness of God, but can I challenge you to believe something aside from that? All, both of those are true. The power and the faithfulness of God is true, but somebody had to pray it. You're that somebody. Somebody had to believe it. You're that somebody. Somebody had to have faith. You're that somebody. Somebody had to stay in it, not quit, not give up. And so look right here. It said, and it came to pass the seventh time. Seven times. We're so easy to quit. I couldn't listen. You know why I can't quit? Because I saw the fire he sent down from heaven. You know why I can't quit? Because I saw a fire that I knew could eat up the, the wood. I knew it could eat up the sacrifice. That fire ate up the rocks. And so I'm going to pray till he answers. I'm going to pray for my kids. I'm even going to speak some things that are not as though they were and just begin to thank him that my kids are saved, that my grandchildren are saved, that my spouse has come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that there's healing in the house, that the house has been blessed by the hand of God, that those that have cancer, that, that we're going to get a good report from the Lord. And it says the seventh time that he sent his servant out, he said, he, the servant, came back and he said, listen, listen to me. There is a cloud, and it's as small as a man's hand rising out on the sea. Y'all see that? He said it's as small as a man's hand. He didn't say it's as big as a man's hand. That might have encouraged something, wouldn't it? It's as big as a man's hand. He said it's as small as a man's hand. 
I had a picture that I was going to put on the screen if I ever used this scripture. And you know when I thought about it? Just now. I saw a picture on the internet about six months ago, and I said, if I ever use that scripture, I'm using that picture. Okay, maybe next time. But it's a picture of a, a clear blue sky, and there's one cloud way out over the ocean. One cloud. And I can imagine when his servant walked out on the, on the edge, out on the ridge, or out on the shoreline, that he put his hand up, and he said, it's a cloud the size of a man's hand. As small as a man's hand. You see, we see so much small, so much little, so many little things, and so many small things that we... Don't give God credit that something big's getting ready to take place. Uh, th 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 that your son said, hey, what time's church tomorrow? But he didn't come, but still, the size of a man's hand. Th 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 the doctor said, you know what, we're going to do another test because something's a little weird right here, we the size of a man's hand. If we could give God the glory for the small things, I can't hardly imagine what's getting ready to take place. And so he gave him glory because he said, look, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. I don't know about you, but I've been on the interstate. We were on the interstate recently. It was raining cats and dogs. I mean, literally cats and dogs. It was a mess. It was pouring the rain. And even with technology, with the wipers we have, there were tractor trailers down to about a 15, 20, 25 mile an hour roll. We're just rolling. And I'm thinking, God, this is crazy. Stop the rain. And it, we won't get into that. But this is a chariot stopping kind of rain. This is a chariot stopping move of God. This is a a chariot stopping, people taking notice, move of God that's getting ready to take place. And he says, get in your chariot, head off of this mountain before this rain stops you. You see, here's the thing about uh, 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 Elijah. He'd seen the big things, absolutely. He'd seen God answer on one prayer, but this one right here, whew, this one sent him running. I don't know if you've read, oh, you got to read it. I don't even know what all I have in here. But it says right here, it says, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. And the sky began, became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. We need a showstopper. You need to quit believing for little. You need to quit throwing in the towel just because you saw the cloud that's the size of a man's hand. You need to quit looking at the little. You need to begin to speak the things that are not as though they were, trusting this God to do something big in your life. We want to squint, we want to frown, and we want to turn up our nose and snarl and scoff at the little things that God's doing for us because we're looking, we're wanting the big thing taken. But listen to me, God is faithful. And when you begin to be faithful over those little things he's doing for you, all I can tell you is get in your chariot and get off of this mountain before that rain comes. It's going to be a chariot stopping rain. It's going to be a people stopping rain. It's going to be a rain that makes people stop in their tracks. I'm... God didn't answer the first time, and maybe that's you. God didn't answer you, maybe the second, maybe that's you. God hadn't even answered on the sixth time, and maybe it's the tenth time. Maybe you've prayed a hundred times, but God is faithful. No matter what, pray. No matter what it looks like, pray. No matter what it looks like, don't give in. He's looking for somebody that's going to stick to it, stick with it, be in it. Amen. Man, I'll tell you, I'm about ready to run. I don't know about you. This is just too... Lens. Let's look at James before I take off running. James chapter 5. Because I don't want you to leave thinking you're less. I don't want you to leave thinking you, this can't be accomplished by your prayers, by your faith, by your belief, by your words. Because it can. Let's look. Verse 17 in James chapter 5 says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. You know what that puts me in the running for? A big rain, a chariot stopping move of God. How do I know that? Because I'm no different than Elijah, except I've got to stick to it. I've got to believe it. I've got to stand faithful. I've got to hang in there. Look, look, look at this next part. He has a nature like ours. Somebody says he has a nature like mine. All right, the, the rest of you, y'all just grab it after church. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the land for three years and six months. And verse number 18, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced fruit. What's going to happen if you don't quit? What's going to happen if you hang in there? What's going to happen if you can believe that though the small things are happening, you're about to give up on the big thing? Listen to me. The big thing's coming. And here's the reason I know that the big thing's coming, because the big thing is going to produce fruit. That big thing in your life, that thing you've been believing for, trusting God for, uh, not giving up on, keep on believing, keep on believing, keep on digging, keep on going, not throwing it. Listen, 
it's going to produce fruit. Don't quit. The, the, the enemy wants you to quit, but it's going to produce fruit. It's going to bring fruit. Stand on your feet for me. Didn't it say the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, produces much? And then he said that Elijah had the same nature as us, the same nature. And so when the enemy tells you you're nothing and you can't, Elijah may have, but he was a great man of God. Listen, you're a great man of God. You're a great woman of God. Don't let the enemy decide who you are and what you are. You're validated by the king of glory. The fact that he was willing to die for you gave you purpose, gave you worth. Calvary gave you worth. You see, I love it. I can go. I, you see, that's the God you serve. That, that's your God. That, that God that I just told you about. That, that sent fire down from heaven that consumed the altar, consumed the rocks, consumed the, the, the water that was in the tree. That's the God you serve. The God that at the size of the cloud, the size of a man's hand, when faith rose up and he spoke a word and said, get off of this hill, because even though it looks like a little thing, God's getting ready to do a big thing. That's your God. That's the God you serve. Ha <laughs> ha. Woo! Hallelujah! That's the God we serve! Yes! 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 Hallelujah! Do you get it? That's the God we serve! Woo! Hallelujah! Y'all have me a spell while y'all wait, but praise God! That's the God we serve! The God that wants to that wants to answer your prayer, the God that you have His ear, the God that will never leave you nor forsake you, the God that spoke purpose and worth over you. Woo! That's your God. That's your God. Amen. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. God, we thank you today. And Lord, I know we've prayed, we've prayed, and we've taught, and we've preached time and time again about your faithfulness and your greatness. In your power and we see that evident Lord in your word and in your scripture but God somebody had to believe somebody had to pray somebody had to step outside of their comfort zone with faith believing that though all I see is a is a cloud the size of a man's hand great things are coming into my life great things are coming into my marriage great things are coming into the house of God Lord, we love you today and Lord, we praise you that every need in this house right now is being spoken right now and poured out in this sanctuary that's being poured out and dumped in this sanctuary. I believe you're a God that wants to meet our needs. I believe you're a God that gives us the desires of our heart. But I don't think it stops with healing. I don't think it stops with finance. I think we can bring our, our, our uh, ambitions to you. We can bring our hopes and our dreams and our aspirations to you. God, you want us to succeed. You want us to succeed for your glory. And so, God, I speak that over this congregation. Success for the glory of God. Promise for the glory of God. Worth for the glory of God. Lord, I come in agreement with every person that's praying right now, that's calling out the name of a loved one, that's calling out a sickness or a disease, that's calling out a financial situation. Every person that's breathing a prayer right now, I come in agreement that two that will agree together, that two will touch any one thing, that you'll do it, that you'll be here. God, we trust you right now. And no matter what happens, devil, we're going to pray. No matter what happens, Satan, we're going to pray. No matter what it looks like, we don't walk by sight, but we walk by faith. Lord, we give you glory in this house today that every need, every need, and Lord, the desires of people's hearts are going to be sent, Lord, and poured out from heaven, God, that the fire of heaven is going to fall on those that want a closer walk with you, that want the call on their life, Lord. They're picking up the phone and answering right now and saying, I'm making myself available from this moment forward because I saw the fire and I saw the cloud and I heard about the rain. So God, we praise you for this congregation today. We praise you that you're our healer, our savior, Lord, our deliverer, our way maker, our protector, our preserver. Hallelujah. God, we praise you today. We give you glory in this house. And with your head still bowed, could you give me just a second? Maybe you came in this building lost and knowing you were undone without Christ, but you were, 
you're ready to start over, start again. Maybe, listen, I'm just going to throw it all in one pile because maybe you just came in ready to give up and throw in the towel. And you're right there with those people that already threw in the towel. But today, both categories want to start over. If that's you, a hand up real quick. I want to start over. I'm going to get my zeal back. I want my fire back. I want to see something happen in my life for the glory of God. Hallelujah. If you raise your hand and you need salvation, just ask him. Say, Lord, forgive me. Come into my, listen, he is here. He don't have to slap anybody upside the head right this second. He is in this building. And he's waiting and you have his ear. Tell him, just say, forgive me. I've crumbled, I've fallen, I've messed up, I've made a mess of my life. He knows all that. However you want to pour it out to him, you have his ear. And just say, forgive me. I make you my Lord and Savior from this moment forward. And if you're that person that your zeal has kind of dropped off or maybe somebody poked a hole in the bottom of your balloon and you've just been losing air, listen to me. Listen, this still falls on your faith. This still falls on you. You've got to get yourself up by faith, knowing that God is there and He's going to help you and He's not finished with you yet. He didn't bring you this far just to bring you this far. That's you. Answer the call this morning. And say, God, I'm back in it. I'm back in it to win it. Just tell him that. I'm back in it. I'm back in it. Look out. Look out. I saw the I saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. <laughs> I saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. Praise the Lord. God, we praise you this morning. We speak glory to you this morning. We ask you right now, Lord, to just visit this place in a mighty way love on your people right now that feel broken love on your people right now that feel hurting love on those that feel confused right now because we realize that God is not the author of confusion we realize that Satan is that guy Satan is trying to sidetrack us and if he can sidetrack us if he can distract us he can defeat us and so God collectively today as a church we're on we're back on track we're in it to win it we're hanging on I'm running off of the hill because I'm expecting a chariot stopping move of God in our lives in Life Changers Christian Center. God, we give you glory in this place. Hallelujah. 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 Somebody say amen and give him a hand clap of praise. <laughs>